Welcome everyone to our enlightened thinking session, Paddling Against Plastic, um, Binding Ocean connection, connection and Nurturing the uh, Endurance Mindset. I'm really delighted today to be joined by Cal Major. Um, Cal is an ocean advocate, she's a veterinary surgeon, and in 2018 she paddleboarded the entire length of the UK. Um, I have had the pleasure of having a sneak peek of Cal's presentation. Um, you might already see on the screen uh, the uh, pictures are absolutely stunning and Cal has a, a lot, an awful lot of very good um, and insightful things to say about how we connect with nature, something which is um, incredibly important to me, but also about um, how we um, are able to uh, be resilient, particularly in uh, today's uh, situation. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to Cal um, and everyone hope you enjoy her session. Thank you very much, Jen. Well, it's lovely to be here and speak to you all. It's always a bit strange giving these presentations online instead of in person, but I'm, um, I'm hoping you're all sat very comfortably with a cup of tea and um, yeah, lovely to be here to chat to you today. So my name's Cal. Um, as Jen said, I am the founder of a campaign called Paddle Against Plastic and I'm also a vet. I studied at Edinburgh Vet School, um, very close to some of you guys I know. Um, and since a very, very young age, I've always loved animals. Since about age seven, I think it was, I declared to my parents that I loved animals so much that they wanted to be a lady farmer. And they kind of worked through that with me and we decided that, um, from, that from that age onwards, really, I decided I wanted to be a vet. And the year before I went to vet school, I fell in love with a different kind of um, subset of animals. And it was the animals out in the ocean. I was 18 and I went to Australia and I learned to scuba dive. And from my first breath underwater, I was hooked by the colours, the peace, the amazing wildlife I was seeing there. You know, there were turtles that were swimming around me as if I wasn't even there, fish that were bigger than I was and multicolored coral reefs. And I decided from that moment onwards that I wanted to dedicate my life to protecting this amazing place. And I was learning more and more about the ocean ecosystems, um, about the animals that live there and about how important the oceans are in our life. And to demonstrate this, I want you to join me um, in a little exercise. So if you can, stand up. I'm not going to stand up because if I did, you'd basically just get a shot of my midriff. Um, but if you can stand up, I want you to stand up and I want you to take a really deep breath with me. So take a deep breath. And now I want you to take another deep breath with me, this time even deeper, the biggest breath you've taken all day. You ready? Okay, go. Okay, now that second breath you took there, the oxygen in that breath was made in the oceans. The oxygen in every second breath we breathe is made in the ocean. How amazing is that? These incredible ecosystems, which are not just beautiful, they are the life force of our planet. They sequester carbon, um, they regulate the temperatures of our, of our globe. They are incredible ecosystems. And this is one of the reasons why I love them so much. Not just that, but the way I feel when I'm there. So having spent a year scuba diving, traveling around Australia, learning about the ocean, I went to vet school back in Edinburgh and graduated and moved down to Devon and followed a fairly typical path my first few years of being a vet. Uh, moved to Devon and um, although it might look like I spent most of my time cuddling cats in Christmas jumpers, it was a pretty hard uh, few years in practice. Um, the hours were very long. I was often working 14 hour days, working nights and days sequentially. Um, I was a general practitioner, but also a radiologist, a dentist, a pharmacist, an oncologist. As a vet, there's an awful lot of pressure put on the individuals to um, both from owners and from the practice. And it was an incredibly stressful job. I loved my day job, but it was really, really stressful. And so at any possible opportunity I was given, um, I would find my way to places like this and do things like this. I would go surfing or swimming or paddleboarding. And the ocean once again became my place of peace and sanctuary. And at that point in time, the, the words, the term mental health wasn't really in my vocabulary. It wasn't something that I was consciously thinking about. 
um, mental illness, you know, we were starting to hear about you know, mental illness, but mental health wasn't really a term in my vocabulary. And I went to the ocean because when I was there, I felt amazing. All the stresses of my daily life, my job, they all calmed down and I got to spend some real quality time just relaxing and recuperating. And the ocean basically became my saviour um, in amongst my, my really, really stressful job. And this was in Bali. Um, I travelled around the world surfing, but also on my doorstep in Devon. Every minute I wasn't working, I was at the beach, I was exploring the coastline, and that's what kept me sane for the first few years in practice. And I spent a lot of time with this wonderful woman. This is Sarah on the right there, on the right of your screen. Um, and we were best friends at uni, and she was also a vet. And on a very regular basis maybe four or five nights of the week we'd call up call each other up after a difficult shift at work and offload and plan our next trip to somewhere where we could really decompress and we could get ourselves back to feeling like humans again after hour upon hour in the veterinary practice one year so this is this is this picture is taken on a ferry on the way to the isle of tyree on the west coast and one year we basically decided we needed to escape and so i drove my camper van from devon to edinburgh where sarah was picked her up and um, we'd heard of this island called tyree and it had been ad advertised to us on the internet as the hawaii of the north and we thought where better to go than the hawaii of the north this was very much um, a misadvertisement it was nothing like hawaii it rained the whole time it was very 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 windy and they're very very cold and we had the best time we spent every day either by the water or out on the water we put our waterproofs on and just got on with it we got to interact with animals like this this little seal without having to clinically examine them and it was just the most wonderful time and this is what Sarah and I did we supported each other on the phone and whenever we could um, we got together and spent time out in nature um, which was our way of, of keeping ourselves well without us even knowing it, it's just what we were driven to do one year we went to Barbados I remember calling her up it was the middle of winter I was absolutely exhausted I was fed up and I called her up and said just wish we could get on a plane to Barbados and right there at that point in time we looked on the internet found very cheap flights and the next week we were in Barbados and we learned to kite surf now, kite surfing, you're basically you're attached to a massive power kite um, and as you can see here at the bottom of the screen there's some pretty big waves to get through out on this beach in Barbados and again at this point in time I didn't really know the term mindfulness um, I did however realise that being strapped to a power kite having to battle your way through head high waves there's not really much else you're going to be thinking about at that point in time and I attribute that to why kite surfing or my spending time in the ocean is so beneficial for my mental health it's the ultimate mindfulness you can't think about your troubles you can't think about that case you left behind at the practice um, you're there in the moment enjoying the colours the sunshine the wind in your hair was also starting to see scenes like this. Now this is in Barbados, this is plastic that had washed up onto the beach and as you can see there's a mixture here of fishing nets and plastic bottles. It wasn't just in Barbados, it was also at home. This is one of my absolute favourite beaches in the world. It might look a bit rainy in this picture but believe me it can look like Barbados sometimes. This is Whitsand Bay in Cornwall and I surfed here a lot, I spent a lot of time paddleboarding here as well. And I'd often come in after a surf and find scenes like this. And this was particularly devastating for me, knowing how much the ocean meant to me, knowing just what the ocean gave to me. And I volunteered with a charity, a local charity called Surfers Against Sewage. And we spent a lot of time clearing up this beach and, and, and getting that plastic off the shore so that it couldn't harm the animals out in the ocean. But I wanted to do more. I felt like I had to do more. I was finding scenes like this. This is in a tiny little cove in Cornwall. Now you can't access this cove by land. It can only be accessed by sea. And it's absolutely tiny. And yet in the back of that cove, I found nearly a hundred plastic bottles washed up into that cove. And I was starting to learn more and more about the plastic pollution crisis and just how damaging it was to our ocean, our ocean which gives us life. And I learned one day that there were 38 and a half million plastic bottles being used in the UK every day. You let that sink in. 38 and a half million plastic bottles are used in the UK every day. And less than half of them are recycled. And those that aren't recycled, they can end up in places like this, in the beaches, damaging our beaches, threatening the wildlife. 
Not only that, they release chemicals and carcinogens into the water and they can fragment into smaller pieces which can be ingested by marine life. And one thing that really struck me about these plastic bottles is that a lot of the bottles I was finding were water bottles and that seemed like such an obsolete item in our society. In the UK, we're blessed with clean, safe, free tap water that we can refill our bottles from. And so I decided that amongst all this doom and gloom and overwhelm of the plastic pollution crisis, I wanted to deliver a positive message. And my positive message was that actually we can all be a part of reducing this issue if we commit to using a refillable water bottle. And so I decided that I was gonna take on a challenge, a, a bit of a challenge over the summer to try and encourage people to take on this message that I was trying to deliver, asking people to commit to refilling their water bottles. And my challenge was, I was going to stand up paddleboard around the whole of the Cornish coast, 300 miles, incorporating part of Devon as well. And this is what I expected it to look like, Cornwall in the summer. How beautiful is that? We've got sunshine. I was going to get a tan. I was going to get a six pack. I was going to paddleboard with dolphins. It was going to be phenomenal. It was going to be the best adventure of my life. And the reality was a little bit different. And for three weeks, I was hit with fog, head high waves, gale force winds and rather than paddling with dolphins I was chased by seals uh, and it was a real real eye-opener for me it was an incredible struggle now I don't know if any of you have ever been paddleboarding before oftentimes it's in a really sheltered beach or a lake or a river and you get to stand on this basically glorified surfboard and propel yourself along and have a jolly good time and it's lovely and wonderful out on the ocean, it's a very, very different matter. And I soon realized that stand-up paddleboarding didn't really lend itself to ocean voyages unless you were willing to battle very, very hard against the elements. And the elements that affect stand-up paddleboarding in particular are wind and tides. So anything below 10 miles an hour of wind, you can just about get away with. Anything more than that, it's a real battle to, 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 to fight against these winds. And that's what I had to do for three weeks here. And yet I felt absolutely exhilarated by it. I learned so much while I was there. I learned the quality, the importance of a good quality dry bag. I learned that if you paddle into a beach through six foot waves, you'll have to paddle back out of the beach through six foot waves. Um, and I learned how powerful taking on an adventure was for delivering a message. There was one day um, I rounded a corner around a headland and was met by a wall of wind and waves. The waves were bigger than I was, the wind was so strong, and I was getting blown closer and closer towards a massive jaggedy cliff. Um, and I paddled as hard as I could to get away from this cliff. I paddled as hard as I possibly could, and I was just getting closer and closer to this cliff. And for about an hour, I battled against these winds and waves, and it took every last ounce of energy I could possibly muster to get away from this cliff. To this day, I do not know how I managed to get out of there. It's incredible the strength that can come to you in moments when you need it the most. And I washed up onto a beach around the corner and we, we were I was with a friend at the time and we were taken in by a family who took pity on us and let us shower in their holiday home in Cornwall. And I came out of the shower back to the kitchen table to see that this family, this entire family, were buying reusable water bottles for their kids and for themselves. And for me, that made it all worth it. The message was getting out there, I was talking to people and people were taking notice. And by capturing their imagination with this adventure, they were listening to the message that I wanted to deliver. So the following year, I decided, oh, I've just gone on too far there. I decided that I was going to paddleboard around the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Now, I'm sure many of you have been to the Isle of Skye. It's glorious. As you well know, it's wild, it's rugged. It has these amazing sea cliffs. And I wanted to show that even these remote places, these wild, wildlife rich places were no less vulnerable to plastic pollution. And so I was going to paddle around the Isle of Skye and I decided to do it alone this time. So I was completely alone on the Isle of Skye. I had all my kit with me, all my food. I had to hike up hills for water when I needed it. And it was incredible how quickly all of the noise of society slowed down when I was out there on my own, when I was camping on my own on, on remote beaches. I spent about eight hours a day on the water, paddling about 20 miles. And it was incredibly difficult. And there were times when I wished there were other people there with me to help to propel me forward, to motivate me. But actually doing that on my own was incredibly empowering. And I found that 
all the important stuff came to the forefront of my mind and all the stuff that society tells you is important, all the noise of everyday life was drowned out by the sound of the ocean. And I was becoming more and more aware of the clouds in front of me. And I, I'd realized that that cloud over there, that's a bit low lying that one. So that means that there's gonna be a massive gust of wind under it. So I'm gonna have to paddle really hard there. Or that that wave over there that's coming towards me, that could be a danger. I'm gonna have to keep an eye on that. And I was so tuned into every minute detail of the environment around me. And for two weeks, I had this amazing mindful experience where all that mattered was getting from point A to point B each day to safety. It was very, very formative and I found it very hard to come back to reality. Um, but being on the island on my own, camping on my own was so special. And there was one day camping on a little remote beach that I found something particularly concerning. And I've got a little video here to show you. Wake up to a load of sheep and cows on the beach. Hilarious. This beach is disgusting. So much plastic on it. This is breaking my heart. This cow is basically chewing on this piece of fishing there. And um, I think she swallowed part of it and she doesn't know what to do. And she's just been stood here for about 20 minutes now, just chewing. And um, if that piece of fish net goes down into a room and she's dead. Oh, it's horrible. I feel so helpless with that. If you just have a push, it'll be fine. But I can't go any closer to him than I already have. She could hit me, she could ram me, she could kill me. She could quite easily kill me. So I think what I'm going to do is pack up quickly and get out onto the water where hopefully there's some signal and phone the knowledge and police number and get them to contact the farm. A little update on our cow. You can see her behind me. Um, she's decided that fishing nets don't taste so good after all. She's managed to irritate, so belch the fishing net up. She's tried to pick it up a couple more times, and after about attempt six, <laughs> and me flapping around and running at her like a mad thing to try and stop her from doing it, she's um, finally stopped attempting to eat the bloody fishing net. But it's only a matter of time until she finds another tasty bit of fishing net, or until one of her mates does, or until a sheep does. It's not just the animals out in the ocean here that's affected by this stuff, it's everything. It's quite hard to see an animal, these are animals that I've sworn an oath to protect, um, being hurt by our actions, by plastic that we've left in the environment. And it can seem very overwhelming. At the time I was very over overwhelmed. Um, but I always think that the antidote to overwhelm is action. And there's so much that we can do about plastic pollution. And that's the beauty of this campaign. There's something that every single one of us can do. And it can start by picking, it can start with picking plastic up in the environment. It could start with choosing a refillable water bottle or taking your reusable carrier bags to the shop. And I think all of these actions, they can seem really small and insignificant, but actually they're the first step in tackling that overwhelm of such an enormous issue. I think the plastic pollution crisis, the onus of it should not come down to the individual. It has to be threefold. It has to be the individual governments and companies all taking responsibility together. However, the government and companies, they're not going to take responsibility until there's enough pressure on them or enough incentive from their customers, from individuals as a whole. And so the more people we can get aware of this issue, the more people whose voices are calling for better, um, better regulation from the government and better actions from companies, the sooner we're going to tackle this problem together. I really wanted to maintain positivity and um, talk about the positive things that we can do to tackle plastic pollution. And so the following year, 2018, I decided I was going to stand up paddleboard the whole length of the UK from Land's End in Cornwall to John O'Groats in the north of Scotland, looking at all the positive things happening around the UK to tackle plastic pollution. Now, a few little facts for you. Um, it's, the it's a thousand mile journey. 
The route I took here, as you can see, is 800 miles of ocean and 200 miles of rivers and canals. And doing the rivers and canals as well, I wanted to demonstrate the relationship between our lives inland and what's going on out to sea. A lot of plastic is originating inland and finding its way out to sea via the rivers and canals. I thought it would take me about four months. It took two months of paddling very reliant on wind and tide forecasts. So as I've mentioned before, being on a stand-up paddleboard, you are so vulnerable to the wind and the tides. Um, and so every day's paddling relied heavily on what the wind was doing, the strength and the direction of the wind, and which way the tides are running. So around the UK, we have very, very strong tides, which basically flow around the, around the coastline. Um, and in a lot of places, you want to be paddling in the same direction of the tide, otherwise you're going to be going backwards. So there was a lot of planning to do on a daily basis to make sure I was on the water at the right time. I had eight days off in two months due to high winds when I couldn't paddle, it was unsafe to do so. I didn't have any boat support, occasionally had um, my boyfriend who is a filmmaker and a photographer um, with me on the water in his kayak. I was paddling an average of eight hours a day, um, exposed to winds from the Atlantic. So as you can see, a lot of this, a lot of the um, coast I was on was the West Coast, which was very exposed to the winds from the Atlantic. So some days I was paddling into headwinds, which would halve the um, speed that I could go at. Some days I had winds coming from the side, which would make me about one third as fast as I normally would be because I'd spend the whole time battling against a wind coming from the side, trying to keep the nose of my board pointing forward, which was incredibly tedious um, and very painful a lot of the time. Occasionally I had a tailwind, which made everything so much better. Life was so much better with a tailwind because I could just fly along with the wind helping me out from behind. My shortest day was an hour and I went half a mile um, and that day I really shouldn't have got on the water but I was so keen to keep going that I tried it and was going backwards for most of that half a mile. Um, and the longest day was 26 hours and 64 miles and I basically just kept going and going and my adrenaline was so high that I didn't stop um, but it was a fantastic day and I'll tell you more about that day in a bit. The biggest waves I was paddling through were about eight foot, um, so they were offshore, so they weren't breaking, but they were really rolling in, um, and that was when I was about 10 miles off from shore, so there were some big crossings to be done, and um, one of the biggest crossings was about 20 miles, which meant that at one point in time I was 10 miles from the nearest point of land, which was pretty terrifying, um, but also once I actually got back to land, um, it was very, very exhilarating. Um, I had some pretty terrifying tides to navigate um, and the Bristol Channel has the world's second highest tidal range which means that the water is flowing very very fast up and down that channel. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of those tides in a moment. Um, I'd started planning this trip and um, in the middle of planning this trip I got a phone call from my friend Sarah who we met earlier who was my dear friend that I did all my adventuring with and if my uh, there we go. There she is, beautiful Sarah. Um, she, this picture, I love this picture of her. It was taken in Sri Lanka when she was spending most of her time by the sea, um, out in nature every day by the water. And it's the happiest I've ever seen her. A few months after this, I had a phone call from her and she called me to say she wasn't very well. She was in tears. Um, she was very depressed and she'd been feeling suicidal. And she was in hospital at the time um, and she was getting better. She was improving. She had a lot of help around her. Um, and we decided that once she was out of hospital, she was going to come and stay with me in my little house in Devon, right by the sea, where she could find that peace every day by being by the water. And that was our plan. Um, that was what we were going to do. And unfortunately, um, Sarah never made it to my house in Devon. A couple of weeks later, um, about three years ago to the day, um, I came out of the water, I've been kite surfing, came out of the water to find a missed call, several missed calls on my phone from a mutual friend of ours. Um, and I just knew that Sarah was in trouble. I called my friend back and was given the news that Sarah had taken her life. She'd been extremely depressed and decided that there was no way out for herself. Um, and nothing really prepares you for hearing that your best friend has decided that there's nothing to live for anymore. And I felt everything from guilt to anger to absolute despair. Um, I had severe physical manifestations of grief and of stress. I was hospitalized with stomach problems because my body just basically had this huge reaction to this enormous grief. 
Um, and more than anything, I didn't know how I would go on without her. How do you carry on without your rock, without that one person in your life who understands who you are, what you've been going through, what it means to be um, a vet in clinical practice, what it means to be in love with the ocean? How do you carry on without that? And so I had a very difficult decision to make. Do I carry on with my trip from Land's End to John O'Groats um, or do I sack it off and spend, spend my time grieving Sarah? And I decided that, you know, she was my biggest fan. She was my biggest support network and she was absolutely um, determined to help me with my campaigns. So I thought, you know what, I have to carry on. I have to do it in her honour. Um, so I was a trustee for a mental health charity for the veterinary profession, Vet Life. Vets are four times more likely than any other profession in the UK um, to commit suicide. And um, I decided that I was going to do it in her honour and raise money for Vet Life for, for her charity. Um, and it was a rather difficult decision to have to make. And I really hoped that I'd made the right decision. Um, but through all that grief, the ocean actually helped me with that grief. And paddle stroke by paddle stroke, I made it from Land's End to John O'Groats. And I've got a little video here which is going to show you how, how that went. Day one of the trip was almost the last day of the trip. Um, 
Land's End is basically a little bit further south than the nearest beach you can get in, so there's Senan Harbour, which is the nearest place you can get in the water. And I basically had to paddle down to Land's End, turn around, and then go back north again on my way up to John O'Groats. Um, and at Land's End, as you can imagine, right on the southwest point of the UK, there is a lot of water movement around there, tides coming in and out of the channel. Um, and so my timing had to be pinpoint perfect to get to Land's End and back again. And I thought it worked out perfectly. I was well on top of it. I'd spent ages figuring out the time I needed to be on the water. I was on the water, it was still dark, but the sun was about to come up. Um, and I paddled down to Land's End. I was flying along. I thought, yes, my training's paid off. Um, got to Land's End, turned around and couldn't get back. I was basically fighting against this tide, which was dragging me further and further out to sea. And it turns out the reason it had been so fast to get down there was that the tide was flowing all the way out into the Atlantic. Um, and I was starting to panic. I was unable to battle against this tide. It was going faster than my fastest paddling speed. And I was paddling and paddling. And by this point I was crying and I was sweating and I was exhausted. And I saw James, my boyfriend, up on the cliff at Land's End. And so I thought, okay, do you know what? I'm just gonna have to get help. So I put my paddle down, distress signal, both arms, big wave. And James is on top of the cliff and he waved back. And I thought, oh God, this is a nightmare. How on earth am I gonna get out of this situation? And I paddled until I was so exhausted, I basically just collapsed on my board. And fortunately there was a fishing boat that came out and they saw me and they came to my rescue and they were all RNLI volunteers in their spare time. And they hauled me onto their boat and took me back to Senan Harbour. And I was so humbled by this experience. I thought I already respected the ocean and here I was at its mercy. Um, and I basically spoke to the RNLI guys and they told me um, that the tides were a little bit out at that point in time and they helped me figure out a time that I could go out again the next day. Um, and I wanted to give up. I didn't want to go out again. The last thing I wanted was to be on the water. Um, but it was an incredibly humbling experience. Some things you just can't battle against. And it reminded me very much of the grief that I felt. Some days I could be fine and I could plow forwards and I could move forwards in my life. And other days I was just being dragged backwards. Um, and some days, you know, there's nothing you can do to fight against those massive tidal streams. Anyway, I got back on my board the next day and I carried on and I've got a little clip of, um, to show you of Cornwall. I thought you'd appreciate just how beautiful the ocean is here. So I'll give you a little, a little clip here. <laughs> So there's one section of the trip which I was particularly worried about and it was this one here, it's the Mull of Galloway. And the Mull of Galloway is this big sticky out pointy bit that you can see on the left hand side of the screen there. Um, and I won't give too much away because um, Dawn's going to share with you a link to the full film we made um, about the expedition. Hopefully you get a chance to watch that and it gives you a bit more of a detailed um, description of how we got around that point. But I've been worried about this section because there are nine tides that meet there, nine tides coming in different directions. And as you could maybe uh, um, imagine, it's extremely exposed to the wind there sticking out into the Irish Sea. 
And I was currently across the other side of that horseshoe bay that you can see 20 miles away, waiting to get around that point. And I was looking at the stars, like the, everything had to be perfect. After Land's End, I was not willing to take any risks with this. I had to be on time for the tides. I had to have the right wind forecast. And I was look, studying these charts day after day for weeks, trying to find a window where I could get around this point. And at last I found a window, but the window was at three o'clock in the morning and I was still 20 miles away on the other side of the bay, which also happened to be a military firing range just to add a little bit of spice in there. Um, and so I had a big decision to make. Do I go out at night? I'd never paddled at night before. Do I go out at night around the gnarliest headland possibly in the UK? Um, or do I just stay here for the next three or four weeks until I get another, another window? And I called up a guy who had been mentoring me. He'd, he'd kayak land into John O'Groats previously. And I called him up expecting him to say, don't be so ridiculous, what a stupid idea, just go to bed. Um, and instead his response was, well, yeah, it's just the same as paddling in the daytime, except you've not got any light, crack on. So I thought, oh, right now I actually have to do it. And I've never been so scared in my life, never been so scared in my life. Getting on that board at 11 o'clock at night to paddle over to the Mull of Galloway, the scariest headland of the trip, for three o'clock in the morning. And I couldn't see anything except um, a lighthouse flashing on the point every few minutes. And it was absolutely terrifying. And um, I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna try and explain how it was because hopefully you get to see the film and that gives you more of a visual representation of, of how that went. But what I will say is having gone through that, having gone through the fear and come out the other side, it was incredibly empowering to know that that was something within my armory. And had I had a safety boat there with me, had I had an option to jump out at any point in time, I possibly would. Um, you know, people say, weren't you scared when you paddle around the Mull of Galloway at night? Of course I was, I was absolutely petrified. And yet because of that, because I expanded my comfort zone into this new level of experience, the final week of my trip, I was able to paddle every single night when the tide and the winds were appropriate. And it opened up a whole new world to me, whereby I was no longer afraid, but exhilarated at the idea of paddling at night. This, this photo is one of my favorite photos of the trip. It was taken on um, a very, very early morning. I set off from Inverness at one o'clock in the morning to get out with the tide going out from Inverness up the northeast coast of Scotland. And I was treated to the silhouettes of enormous dolphins as the sun rose in front of me. And those last, that last week of paddling, I paddled at one o'clock in the morning, then the next morning, two o'clock in the morning, then the next morning, three o'clock in the morning. And every morning I got to see the sunrise from the water. And it was one of the most special times of the trip. Um, and so um, I, I feel really, really grateful to have pushed myself through that fear to, to the point where I could now enjoy that rather than be absolutely petrified and imagine eyes popping up out of the water next to me. So after two months I made it to John O'Groats and um, I was absolutely exhausted, I was completely broken. The trip had been more to me than I could ever have imagined. That time out on the water, that was where I'd healed. I spoke to Sarah every day, I cried pretty much every day. Um, I was mindful of the water as much as I possibly could and having that space and that time everything felt raw and it felt real being on the water things felt real it didn't feel like there was nonsense coming at me from all sides like there is oftentimes in our daily lives and it gave me the opportunity to really process what Sarah had meant to me and what our relationship had meant and how on earth I was going to carry on my life without this 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 person who had meant so much to me um, and I was incredibly proud of myself, but also pretty exhausted. And one of the things I get asked a lot is um, how I kept going. How, you know, how do you keep going day after day? It was relentless. Every day I'd have to get up in, in, you know, in all worlds of pain in my shoulders, get back on the water and keep paddling. But I came up with a checklist of 10 things that um, I call mastering the endurance mindset, which are tips that I think we can use whether we are paddling the length of the country, tackling something like climate change or plastic pollution, or whether it's our daily to-do list or just getting into the office every day, especially at a time like now, when everything feels like such a slog, every day feels the same, we're working from home. It's a really, really difficult time. And I hope that there's something in here that you can pick up on that might help you um, to feel a little bit less like it's a slog every day. So my first one is to acknowledge it's going to be tough. Endurance stuff is tough. Going to work every day for months on end without knowing when this pandemic is going to finish, it's tough. And I think once you let yourself acknowledge that and let yourself feel that, 
things get a lot easier. If you're expecting it to be a walk in the park, it's going to be even more difficult when things, um, obstacles are in your way or when it's really, really challenging day to day. Knowledge it's going to be tough, but that by being tough and by overcoming that, that is such an empowering thing to have done. Have a reason to continue. My reason was pretty clear. I was raising money for charity and I was talking about something I cared about desperately, about plastic pollution. That was my why. What's your why? It can be something really trivial. It can be that you've got a paycheck at the end of the month, or it can be that you enjoy a person that you work with, um, or if it's a bigger project, what is the reason behind it? And keep hold of that. Have it written down somewhere so that when the going gets tough, you can refer back to it and it keeps you motivated. Break each step down as far as possible. This is the breaking the elephant down into bite-sized chunks. I broke the journey down into, day, into days, so into this section, this section, this section, but I also broke each day down into an hour. So each hour I would um, I break the day down into I'm gonna get here in this next hour and here in this next hour. And then I broke it down further. I broke it down to the point of I'm going to get to that boy, that C boy there in the next two minutes and get to that C boy. And then I'm gonna to get to that C boy in two minutes. And then I'm gonna to get to the end of that cliff in three and a half minutes and I time it. And by having those achievable little goals, it made each day, each endless day on the water seem a lot more manageable. And I celebrated each milestone along the way. So each hour, a little, or each mile, a little buzzer would go off on my GPS watch. And every time I'd got through an hour or got through five miles, I'd have a snack. It sounds so simple, but I'm very food motivated. I'm like a Labrador. Um, each mile, each hour, I would have um, have a little snack and that kept me going. Um, or, you know, I'd say after four miles or after four hours or something like that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to call my mate. I'm going to have a little chin with my friend. And that's my that's my celebration. Couldn't always stop and have a chat with my mate, depending what the sea conditions were like. But you get the gist. Celebrate it and give yourself something to celebrate that each step on the way. It's important to look forward at what's to come, but I think it's also really important to look back at how far you've come. Let's look back now at what we've managed to achieve this year. It might seem that it's been very disrupted and actually what we thought we were gonna achieve has been put on a sideline, but what have we achieved? When you actually look back through and you write everything down that has, has been achieved, it can be incredibly motivating and empowering. So yes, look forward, but also don't forget to look back at how far you've come. When the going got really tough, if I had another four miles or another three miles to go to shore and I knew it was gonna take me another hour and I just wanted to give up, I knew I couldn't give up because I had to get back to land. And the thing I'd ask myself is, can I do one more stroke? Can I do just one more stroke? And the answer was always yes. And then can I do one more stroke? Yes, I can. One more stroke? Yes, I can. It's like climbing up a hill. Can I do one more step? Yes, I can. And the answer is almost always yes. So rather than thinking, can I do four more miles? No, I can do one more stroke though. And then another stroke. And before you know it, you've done those four miles. I like to visualize as well before I got on the water every day, particularly on tough days when I had big crossings to do and I knew it was gonna be tedious. I'd like to visualize it. So sit and for a few minutes before I got on the water and think about what is this gonna feel like when I'm on the water? What's it gonna feel like when I'm 10 miles out from sea and I'm alone and I'm scared? What am I gonna do in that moment to mitigate that? And I think that's something we can do with big projects as well. What's this gonna feel like two months into this project when I wanna give up? And what am I going to do at that point in time so that when you are there in that situation, you have the tools and you know you have a plan as to what you're going to do. Feed and hydrate yourself. It only takes a tiny bit of dehydration to, um, to, to lose your energy. Um, so I would feed myself regularly and hydrate myself regularly. Fuel your body with the kind of stuff that you know is going to make you work at your best. Cultivating positivity. It's really easy to get negative. It was really easy for me on the water to be like, this is so boring or tedious or painful. As soon as those thoughts started to creep in, it was a downward spiral. And so I try really hard to notice those thoughts coming in and to, to, and to acknowledge them and then replace them with something positive. And I think maintaining positivity is such a powerful tool. Nurturing mindfulness as well. That, to me, this is the most important thing when I'm out on the water. If I let my mind drift away with me and I'm thinking about anything and everything, it can become very overwhelming to think of paddling 40 miles in a day. If I think about what's happening here and now in this moment, if I watch that wave, if I look over that cliff and really examine the cracks in the cliff, if I pay attention to that gannet that's dive bombing there in front of me, 
beautiful mindful moments in every day and that is so powerful and we have mindful moments in every day of our lives even chopping your veg to go in a casserole really pay attention what are you doing in that moment and those are the little wonderful amazing things that we can get from life which i think are so often overlooked i love chopping an onion because you can see the way it all falls to pieces in different sections and it sounds so maybe a bit silly but little mindful moments in everyday life. When you're walking to your car, what trees are you seeing? What leaves are you seeing? What's on the floor? Really pay attention to what you're seeing and what you're feeling. So I want to very quickly go back to that day after I paddled around the Mull of Galloway. And I met a group of people. I um, basically collapsed in a pub, met a group of people who surrounded me after I woke up. And this was them. Um, they all lived in Port Patrick, which is a little fishing village, and they were all so desperately in love with the place that they lived. So much so they were doing everything they could to protect it. This is the group of people. And as soon as I told them about what I was doing about plastic, they were instantly on board. They organised for me to go and see um, the school locally and talk to them about plastic. They organised a beach clean. Um, they put me up in the local B&B, they fed me in their pub, and they instantly became my friends. And what I realised is the reason that these people cared so much is that they absolutely loved that beach that they lived on. And this is so typical. People protect what they love. People protect what they love. This is um, Gordon and Carolyn who run a um, fish and chip van near the, near the sea and they replace all the plastic with compostable materials so that they would not be polluting the environment with plastic. These guys all cared so passionately and they didn't all necessarily tell me that it was their mental health that was improved by being by the sea, but it's how they felt being by the sea that made them love it. That was very um, compared quite starkly with places like Wigan in North Manchester, where I was finding in one morning, this is just in one hour of paddling, I found 700 plastic bottles floating in the canal. I really think this is because of the disconnect that we have. 80% of people in the UK are living in urban environments. As a society, we've become incredibly disconnected from our natural world. And that is, you know, how can we be expected to protect our natural world if we're not connected to it, if we don't feel a personal connection to it? People protect what they love, but they can only love what they know. And I really think that in order to expect people to want to protect nature, they have to feel a connection to it. We need this mass reconnection to nature. And there's another reason we need this as well. There's a pandemic of mental health problems in the UK, um, depression, anxiety, a lot of mental health issues which aren't necessarily um, related to um, connecting to nature. However, there's a lot that can be done through our connection to nature. Spending time in nature, especially by the water, is clinically proven to be beneficial for our mental health. Um, and at this point in time, I'd just like to mention that we all have mental health, okay? We might not all have mental illness, but we all have mental health. And I'm not suggesting that Sarah could have been saved by more time in nature or that people with really severe mental illness, um, the solution is solely time in nature. However, we can all benefit from time in nature. And I love this quote by John Muir, which is that thousands of tired, nerve shaken, over civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home, that wildness is a necessity. How perfect is that? It doesn't have to be the mountains, it doesn't have to be the ocean, it's somewhere that means something to you. It can be a park down the road, it can be a river, just somewhere where you can put your phone on silent and go and spend some mindful time. Mindful time is all about really focusing in on exactly what's going on in the moment. What can you see? What can you hear? And on that note, I'd like you to just spend, you know, we're running out of time, so I'd like you to just spend 30 seconds with me. I'd like you to close your eyes, please. And I promise I won't make you breathe again this time, um, but I'd like you to just think about a place in nature, somewhere natural, that means something to you. It could be a river, it can be the ocean, it can be a mountain. And I want you to think, how does it feel to be here? What can you smell? What can you see? What can you hear? And how does it feel to be here? And what would you be willing to do to protect it? So if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this, it's that 
spending time out in nature, more time outside, connecting to a place that means something to you is going to be valuable, not just for you, but for the planet as well. The more connected we are to our local environments, the more likely we are to protect them and the more able we are to protect them. And it's been proven that local communities are the most effective at protecting their local environments. I think oftentimes we're very reluctant to do things that aren't productive, aren't seen as productive, um, but looking after our mental health is one of the most productive things we can do. After I finished my trip from London to John O'Groats, I suffered with very, very severe depression. Um, I think my grief flared back up. Um, I was really missing my adventure and I had an enormous crash after days and days on end on the ocean. Um, and being back in the ocean is what, what healed me, just like it healed my grief. And I'm not suggesting that um, nature is the cure to all mental illness. But now having gone through depression, you know, it was the scariest time of my life. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. I was absolutely petrified. I honestly thought I was going to die. I did not know how I was going to get out of the other side. Um, and I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. But I'm very grateful to have come out the other side and experienced it so that now I can hopefully inspire you to take your mental health seriously. Now I take my mental health more seriously than any other part of my life. Um, just like I, I look after my physical health. Um, it's... It's spending that daily time out in nature is what keeps me sane and what keeps me well. And I hope that you guys can find a connection to the to the great outdoors as well. Um, so that's it from me. I apologise that we've run on a little bit, but I know we've got a few minutes for questions and answers. Dawn's going to send you a link to the um, film that we made about the expedition. Um, and I'm also currently setting up a charity called C4, which is all about um, connecting people to nature, helping people who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity or the know-how to spend time out in nature, out by the oceans, by the rivers. It's giving them people the opportunity to find that connection for their well-being and so that they're hopefully want to protect these results. If you'd like any more information about that, please get in touch. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. And please do feel free to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Cal. And thank you for, for being so open with us. I think that people like you being so open with um, others about their experiences, particularly with mental health and, and the experience you had with your, your friend, Sarah, which is incredibly sad, is so powerful for people to hear, particularly as they've been dealing with and issues with mental health in the last nine months or so. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. And, and your story is, of course, um, incredibly inspiring. Um, and we have a few questions I'm, I've been asked here. Um, the first one I'm going to ask you about is actually one that we talked about um, earlier, which is, you know, if there is something that we can do to reduce our plastic, you know, what are the are there websites, information that we can look at that we can find alternatives to using? For example, shampoos, uh, household items that have plastic in them. Where do you have a resource that you go to to figure out what ingredients are in products or what better ways you can, can reduce your plastic use? Yeah, and, and like I mentioned, it is a really important thing that we um, take individual responsibility. The sole responsibility doesn't fall on us. So I'd like everybody to remember to feel proud of what you can do rather than guilty of what you can't do. Um, I have a website which is paddleagainstplastic.com. There's lots of resources on the blog section there. Um, there's an app called Beat the Microbead where you can scan toiletries to see if it contain if they contain microbeads. Um, and other great um, organisations are City to Sea. They're a fantastic organisation. They've got loads of information on their website as well. Um, there are also lots of Facebook support groups for going plastic free. Great. And um, I, mean, I think I always think that when I, one thing I did on lockdown, I don't know if it was by default or otherwise, but I, I got rid of my plastic toothbrush and I have a bamboo toothbrush now. <laughs> my little, it's about that, it's about what you were saying as part of your, your, your checklist, isn't it? It's that, that one more stroke. It's what, what one other thing can I do to, to make the situation better? Exactly. And in terms of how we get out into nature, um, we've been asked a question about, about paddle boarding. So um, a person has asked a question, they've, they've, they've made the investment and they've got the, the paddle board um, what, you know how can they, we encourage other families to get out there and experience paddle boarding or indeed just using the ocean um, more um, the lochs here in Scotland the lakes down in England what would you suggest that families can do to, to better get into nature and particularly where there's water? 
Yeah, and it's so important, isn't it? And I think it's important that we experience nature in our own backyard so that we can continue to go there time and time again, form that relationship with it and, and want to protect it. Um, I think the first thing is to, um, if it's paddleboarding specifically, is to find a paddleboarding club locally. There are loads of paddleboarding clubs around the UK. It's really taken off this year. And so I think connecting with a group of people who already know where to paddle, what the conditions are, how to plan a paddleboarding experience, that's going to be your best bet to start with. Um, I do feel that there is a massive proportion of the country who perhaps you know aren't going to engage in conversations that we're having like this today because they just don't realize that they can be part of that conversation as well and that's specifically what I'm trying to do with the, the charity Seafall it's basically there, there are one in five kids in the UK who've never been to the sea it's approaching those guys and, 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 and people who otherwise wouldn't have either the finances or the know-how to, to spend time by the water and um, giving them those experiences and then helping to relate that to what they can do in their in their daily life in their um, environment and I think you know you don't have to have a hardcore adventure to go and enjoy nature. I, I go for a little walk every day and literally walk um, down to the lake and back again. Um, and it's the little things that are really, really potent for my, my well-being. So it's looking at the colours of the trees, it's smelling the air, it's seeing what wildlife's about. I think we spend so much of our time in our mobile phones, um, you know, walking on the street, looking at them. Put your mobile phone in airplane mode, put it in your back pocket if you need to take it with you um, and just go and try and really engage all your senses. That's what mindfulness is about. It's about really being in the present moment. And OK, it can it can sound a little bit out there, but actually it's really easy to do. It doesn't have to be a, a particularly spiritual experience. You can literally just go and really focus on what you can see, what you can hear, what you can smell. And I guarantee that you'll find something that puts a smile on your face that you would otherwise have overlooked. Actually, we were talking earlier about the fact that even if it's a circumstance where you, you can't get outside, because lots of people are in places where they can you know, go out into nature, they're, they're living in cities or they just they can't get out because they've got kids that are tied to and, and, and just other commitments, they can't get outdoors. Um, and we talked about the fact that there are lots of TV programmes now that you can watch, one which everyone should watch tonight, isn't it? To Autumn Watch, you're, um, you're going to be on, on Autumn Watch. I think lots of people watch Autumn Watch. Um, was well, BBC Two at 8 p.m. tonight and actually lots of these programs is that right um perfect and um i think that with um with lots of these programs you can get that connection just as you say putting the phone and phone down for a while and, and watching nature on, on on screen yeah equally you know i appreciate not everybody lives by the sea or by a lock um there's lots in our you know our cities a lot of our cities have um, green spaces. Um, can you try and utilise some of those? Canals have phenomenal life along them and lots of cities have canals running through them. Or, you know, do you have um, a, a small garden or a patio area where you can put some plants, where you can just be outside by nature? I know it's so hard and this year has been so hard in that regard. Um, but I do think that there are lots of ways that even in cities and a lot of cities are trying to kind of green the cities and have green spaces for people. Um, there's, there, are, there are a lot of opportunities um, to, to try and get outside and spend a bit of time outside it's a really tough one this year it's been, been been really challenging for lots of people i do appreciate that um thank you everybody for joining us and thank you in particular cal and um, that's been incredibly insightful and i say very uh, powerful particularly in relation to mental health as well and um, the recording will be um, available on our website um and um we the next session that we're going to have for enlightened thinking is um going to be on setting a pathway to net zero so almost a follow-up from what you've been talking about uh, Cal um, and that's going to be with Anne Johnson of Fair Future Partnership and um, that's on the 11th of November at 11 30 and you can sign up via our website thank you everyone for joining us and thank you again Cal thank you everybody thanks a lot